Hello. We've been spending a lot of time talking about solutions. I'm going to talk now about solution sets. It's a subtle but important difference. So I'm going to begin by talking about the difference between solutions and solution sets. And to help us visualize this, I am going to talk about graphing solution sets as well. Then I'm going to talk about some special kind of equations that we call identity equations and inconsistent equations. In order to really have a full discussion about this, I need to introduce the empty set, and I also need to talk about the set of all real numbers. Then I am going to talk about the different types of solution sets you encounter when solving linear equations. And finally, I am going to talk about solutions and solution sets to inequalities. And I am going to introduce what we call set builder notation. Anne is going to follow me talking more about inequalities, and she's going to introduce something that we call interval notation. So let's first tackle this issue of what's the difference between a solution and a solution set. And we're going to begin our discussion by considering the equation x equals 7. Now we know that the solution to this equation is 7, because obviously if we replace x with 7, the equation x equals 7 is true. So let's talk about how we might graph this solution. Notice that I have introduced a number line onto the screen. And this isn't just any old number line. This is an x number line, which we can see by the presence of this letter x in the upper right part of the number line. We're looking for values of x that solve this equation. And we know that that number is 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a big old dot over the point 7. So graphically, I am indicating that the value of x that satisfies this equation is 7. Now we're going to introduce this new idea of a solution set. What is the solution set to the equation? Well, first and foremost, the solution set to the equation must be a set. Now let's recall one way that we write sets. One way that we write sets is we use a pair of braces. And we put the numbers that belong to the set between the braces. So for this particular equation, since the only solution is 7, the only number in the solution set is the number 7. So we say that the solution set is the set with the number 7. The number 7 is called an element of the set. Another word we use for this number 7 that is inside the set is member. The number 7 is also called a member of the solution set. So the solution set is the set whose only element is the number 7 or whose only member is the number 7. Let's consider the equation the absolute value of x equals 8. We haven't talked at all about how you might solve this equation. So let's think it through. Now recall that the absolute value of x is the distance between 0 and x along the real number line. Since we're going to consider distances along the real number line, it might be handy to have a real number line to help us with our visualization. And notice that once again, this is an x real number line because we're looking for values of x. Now we want to identify the points on this number line that are 8 units from 0. Looking to the right of 0, it's pretty easy to see that 8 is the number that is 8 units to the right of 0. So one solution to this equation is 8 because the absolute value of 8 equals 8. But we also need to look to the left of 0. And when we look to the left of 0, we see that negative 8 is also 8 units from 0. So negative 8 is also a solution to this equation. The solutions to the equation are 8 
and negative 8. So our next question is, what is the solution set to the equation? Well, a solution set is a set of numbers. And in this example, the solution set is the set that contains the two elements, 8 and negative 8. Now let's notice that this equation has two solutions, but it only has one solution set. And that solution set contains the two solutions to the equation. This equation has two solutions, but only one solution set. It turns out that different equations have different numbers of solutions, but every equation always has exactly one solution set. So you might encounter an equation that has 10 solutions, but that same equation only has one solution set, and that's the set containing those 10 solutions. Now I'm going to talk about some special types of equations that we call identity equations and inconsistent equations. And I'm going to introduce the empty set and talk a little bit about the set of all real numbers. So let's consider the equation x plus 4 equals x. What are the solutions to this equation? Well, let's verbalize this equation. In words, this equation is saying what number x could we add 4 to and end up with the number x that we started with. Um, I don't think there is any number that we could add 4 to and end up with the same number that we started with. So what are the solutions to this equation? There are no solutions to this equation. Regardless of what number we substituted for x, this equation would always be false. What is the solution set for this equation? Well, the solution set for any equation is the set that contains the solutions to the equation. So I go ahead and I write my set brackets, my braces, and I set out to write the numbers that satisfy the equation inside these set braces. There are no such numbers, so I'm done writing my solution set. My solution set is empty. And a set that is empty is called the empty set. The empty set is the set which contains no elements. There's two ways to write an empty set. I can write my set brackets with nothing in them. That's an empty set. We also have a, have a symbol for the empty set. It sort of looks like a zero with a slash from the upper right corner to the lower left corner. Um, believe it or not, it is important that you get that slash in the proper direction because if the slash goes in other directions, the symbol actually has other meanings. There's a mistake people sometimes make when they write the empty set. It's incorrect to write an empty set symbol inside set brackets to indicate the empty set. And I have a little analogy that I think will help you understand why that's incorrect. What I have here are two empty boxes. So we can think of each of these empty boxes as representing the empty set. Now let's check out what happens if we take that empty orange box and we plop it into the empty green box. The empty green box is not empty anymore. The green box is no longer the empty set because it's no longer empty. It contains a box. The same thing happens if I take my set bracket representation of the empty set, and I take my symbol representation of the empty set, and I try and force that empty set symbol inside those brackets. The set defined by the brackets are no, is, is no longer empty. There's something sitting inside the set. Let's consider a different equation. Let's consider the equation x plus x equals 2x. What are the solutions to this equation? Well, in words, this equation is asking us, what number can you add to itself and get 2 times that number? That would be 
every number. That's what two times a number means. It means the number added to itself. So what are the solutions to this equation? Every real number is a solution to this equation. So what is the solution set to this equation? Well, one thing's for sure, it's a pretty darn big set because the set needs to contain every single real number. And I think if we tried to write down every single real number, we come to the conclusion pretty quickly that it's a task that's never going to end. Luckily, somebody has come up with a symbol to represent the set of all real numbers. The solution set to this equation is the set of all real numbers. And the way we freehand write the um, symbol for the set of all real numbers is we start by writing two vertical bars, and then we make a scripty looking R from those two vertical bars. In books and in printed material, rather than using this kind of flourished R for the set of real numbers, sometimes what you'll see is a capital R made really, really bold. So sometimes when you're reading, if you see a really, really bold capital R, you want to be thinking the set of all real numbers. So what's the solution set to our equation? It's um, the set of all real numbers, which is communicated by this symbol right here. Now let's think what would happen if we encountered this equation, x plus x equals 2x, and we tried to solve this equation using our strategy for solving linear equations. So we start with our equation x plus x equals 2x, and the first thing we do is we simplify the left side of the equation, and we get 2x equals 2x. Well, the equation 2x equals 2x is a manifestation of what we call the reflexive property of equality. Any expression always equals itself. 2x equals 2x regardless of the value of x. This is called an identity equation because this equation is always true. And every real number is a solution to an identity equation. Now suppose we didn't recognize that we have an identity equation, and we try and isolate x. Regardless of which side we try to isolate x, we need to subtract 2x from both sides of the equation, and that results in the equation 0 equals 0. 0 equals 0 is just flat out called an identity. It's true. 0 equals 0. Our original equation is equivalent to the true statement, 0 equals 0. So our original equation must always be true. Now let's go back to our x plus 4 equals x equation. What happens when we try to solve this equation using our strategy for solving linear equations? We start with x plus 4 equals x. When we try to isolate our variable, it doesn't matter which side we go, we need to subtract x from both sides, and yikes, we end up with 4 equals 0. The equation 4 equals 0 is called a contradiction because, you know what, it's just plain false. It's a false statement. Any equation that is never true is called a contradiction. Variable equations that are never true are also called inconsistent equations. Inconsistent equations have no solution. If your original equation is equivalent to a contradiction involving two numbers, that's a clear sign that you have an inconsistent equation, and the equation has no solution. There was a lot of vocabulary there, so let's review some definitions. A solution to an equation is any number that makes the equation true. The solution set to an equation is the set of all numbers that make the equation true. Each equation has exactly one solution set. Some equations have no solution. Such equations are called inconsistent equations. They are also called contradictions. The solution set for an inconsistent equation is the empty set. Some equation solution sets contain all of the real numbers. 
That is, there are equations out there for which every real number makes the equation true. Such an equation is called an identity, and the solution set to an identity is the set of all real numbers. Now, earlier I talked about the fact that sometimes there are equations that have perhaps 10 solutions. Well, such an equation wouldn't be a linear equation because there's a finite number of possibilities for the solution set to a linear equation. The solution set for any linear equation with a single variable is one of three things. It could be a set containing exactly one number, it could be the empty set, or it could be the set of all real numbers. So let's find the solutions and the solution sets for each of the following equations. Let's start with the equation 2 times x plus 5 equals 3x minus the quantity x minus 10. Let's begin by finding our proposed solution. So I'm pretending that I'm working by myself, so I'm going to go ahead and write down my original equation because I probably if I was a student, I'd be getting this equation out of the book, so I'd want to go ahead and write it on my paper. Or even if I was taking a test, I'd want to go ahead and ham write it on my paper. Now, the first thing I need to do is simplify both sides of the equation. On the left, when I distribute 2 through the parentheses, I get 2 times x plus 2 times 5, which is 10. On the right, I need to distribute that subtraction sign through the parentheses. Remember that in a sense, we can think of that subtraction sign as plus negative 1. And so I need to distribute negative 1 through the parentheses. And the net effect is that I'm going to change the sign on each term inside the parentheses. I'm going to have a minus x and a plus 10. Now I still have some combining to do on the right. I get 2x plus 10 equals 2x plus 10. I have an identity. I have a reflexive equation. The expression 2x plus 10 always equals the expression 2x plus 10. So I see right here that my um, solution is going to be the set of all real numbers. So the solution set is the set of all real numbers. How can we check this solution? Well, recall I started this segment by saying that any linear equation has one of three types of solution sets. A solution set with one number, a solution set with zero number, z, or a solution set that contains every number. So one way I could check this is I could show that two different numbers satisfy the equation because since two elements is not an option for our solution set, if there's two elements, every number must be an element of the solution set. Now I'm going to pick easy numbers to check. I have that under my control since I don't have one specific solution. So let's see what happens if x is 0. If x is 0, then the expression on the left side of the equation, 2 times quantity x plus 5, becomes 2 times quantity 0 plus 5. 0 plus 5 is 5. 2 times 5 is 10. And the expression on the right, which is 3x minus quantity x minus 10, it becomes 3 times 0 minus quantity 0 minus 10. 3 times 0 is 0 minus uh, 0 minus 10 is negative 10. And subtracting negative 10 is the same as adding positive 10. When x is 0, the expression on the left is 10. The expression on the right is 10. So 0 is a solution to this equation. If x equals 1, then the expression 2 times x plus 5 becomes 2 times quantity x, uh, excuse me, 1 plus 5. 1 plus 5 is 6. 2 times 6 is 12. And the expression on the right, 3x minus quantity x minus 10, becomes 3 times 1 minus quantity 1 minus 10. 3 times 1 is 3. 
We need to subtract from that 1 minus 10, which is negative 9. Subtracting negative 9 is the same as adding positive 9, and whoo boy, 3 plus 9 is 12. And what was the whoo boy all about? Because when x is 1, we get 12 on both sides of the equal sign. So 1 is a solution, 0 is a solution. If a linear equation has two numbers in its solution set, a linear the same linear equation has every real number in its solution set. So what are the solutions? What is the solution set? Well, here's a real number line, um, which I've identified as x because that is um, my variable that I had in my equation. Every real number is a solution, and I indicate that by drawing a line over my real number line with arrows at each end to indicate that no matter where you are on the number line, you have a solution. So what are the solutions? Every real number is a solution. What is the solution set? The solution set is um, the set of all real numbers. Notice that there's lots of solutions. As a matter of fact, there is an unlimited number of solutions. But there's only one solution set, the set that contains all those solutions. Let's look at 4t plus 7 equals 11. To solve this, I'm going to begin by moving my 7 to the right side of the equation by subtracting 7 from both sides of the equation. That gives me the equivalent equation, 4t equals 4. And I can now isolate t by dividing both sides of the equation by 4. And I end up with the equivalent equation, t equals 1. And it's obvious that the solution to this equation is 1. How can we check this solution? Well, we've been doing this a lot. This is easy. All we need to do is replace t with 1. And since we only have one variable expression, we need to evaluate. If t is 1, then the expression 4t plus 7 becomes 4 times 1 plus 7. 4 times 1 is 4. Add that to 7, and we get 11. So our answer checks, because the equation is true when t is 1. So what are the solutions? What is the solution set? Here's our t number line. The only solution was the point 1 on our t number line. So the solution is the number 1. However, the solution set is not a number. It's a set. And in this case, specifically, it's the set whose only element is the number 1. Let's look at the equation 2 minus quantity 5 minus 6e equals 6e plus 3. I'm going to begin by um, simplifying the left-hand side, which means I need to distribute that subtraction sign through the parentheses. I can just remember that that's going to change each sign inside the parentheses. Or I can think of that subtraction sign as a plus negative 1. And multiplying by negative 1 inside the parentheses is going to change the sign on each term in the parentheses. Any way I correctly think about it, the left side initially simplifies to 2 minus 5 plus 6z. And this equals my right side, which is 6z plus 3. Combining my constants on the left, I have negative 3 plus 6z equals 6z plus 3. Now right here, I'm seeing we have a contradiction. I have this number out there, 6z. You know, I replace z with a value. I, 6z is a number. And this is saying negative 3 plus what number equals the same number plus 3. Well, there is no such number. But let's say that I, I didn't really recognize that. Let's go ahead and try and isolate our z's. Whichever side I try and isolate z, I'm going to have to subtract 6z from both sides of the equation. And when I do that, holy smokes, I'm left with the equation negative 3 equals 3. That's just plain not 
true. This is a contradiction. So our proposed solution is that there is no solution because our original equation is equivalent to this contradiction. How can we check the solution? Well, this is really a tricky situation because normally what we do is we replace the variable with either its one solution or with a couple solutions and make sure the two sides are equal. We don't have any number to replace the variable with. I guess we could try and replace the variable with an empty set symbol, but, but then I think we'd say, well, you know what? You can't do arithmetic with an empty set symbol. So we're just out of luck. There's no way to check this other than going back and checking our work and making sure we didn't make any boo-boos or getting out another sheet of paper and working the problem from scratch and making sure that we get the same conclusion. What are the solutions? What is the solution set? Well, again, let's begin by looking at this graphically. Notice that I have a Z number line this time because the variable in the equation was the letter Z. First thing I want to do is graph the solution set. So here I go. Nothing happened. That's because there are no solutions. So there are no points to plot on my number line. What are the solutions? There are no solutions. But there has to be a solution set because every equation has exactly one solution set. What is the solution set? The solution set is the empty set. And I have a symbol for the empty set that looks like that. Or I could write two um, set brackets with nothing between them. Now we're going to talk about inequalities. We're going to talk about the difference between a solution to an inequality and a solution set to an inequality. And I'm going to introduce something called set builder notation, which is a way to write a solution set to an inequality. So let's begin with this kind of open-ended question. How can we describe the set of all real numbers greater than negative 2? Well, one way we could do it is graphically. So I um, begin by drawing a number line and making sure that at least one of the points on this number line is the number negative 2. I'm also going to go ahead and assign a variable name to this number line because it's going to come in handy when I, when I try coming up with other ways of describing the set. So I just kind of arbitrarily pick the number x. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to indicate that negative 2 is the endpoint of this set. But I'm going to indicate it with an open circle rather than a solid dot because negative 2 is not part of the set. So there's my open circle around negative 2. Now the numbers that are greater than negative 2, they lie to the right of negative 2 along the number line. So I'm going to go ahead and shade in the number line to the right of negative 2. But I'm also going to carefully make sure that I put an arrowhead at the end of this um, half line to indicate that this half line never stops, that we just keep on going. Now let's suppose we wanted to use set notation to describe this set. Can we correctly write something like this, the set containing the numbers negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3? And the answer is no, we can't. because. If we look at our graphical representation of this set, we can see that there's a whole lot of points in the set that just are not implied by the pattern negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. For example, um, the number 1 half is in our set, but it's not implied by the pattern negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So the question is then, what can we correctly write? And this is where set builder notation comes in. The set builder notation is, of course, first and foremost, a set. And I'm going to begin the set by referring to my variable, which I chose to be x. And then I'm going to follow this by a vertical bar. And this vertical bar can be read one of two ways. It can be read as 
x such that, so the vertical bar being read as such that, or it can be read x with the property that, so the vertical bar could be read with the property that. So we have the set x such that, well, what's true about x? x is greater than negative 2, so we can use our inequality symbol greater than to communicate the defining property about x. So let's graph the solution set to the inequality 4 is greater than or equal to t, and let's state the solution set using set builder notation. So I begin with a number line, making sure that 4 is one of the points on this number line. I also make sure that I indicate that in this case we have a t number line. The endpoint of this solution set is going to be the point 4. This time I'm going to use a solid dot because 4 does satisfy the inequality. 4 is greater than or equal to 4, and so I in indicate inclusion with a solid dot. Saying that 4 is greater than t means that 4 lies to the right of t along the number line. So I need to draw a line segment to the left of 4, and I need to make sure I remember to put an arrowhead at the end of this half line to indicate that this half line never ends. This half line is actually called an interval, so our solution set is the interval that has no left-hand endpoint and has a right-hand endpoint at 4, and 4 is included in the solution set. So um, the next thing that we want to do is we want to state our solution set, and we want to state it using set builder notation. So the solution set is, it's the set of numbers t with the property that, now I could say that the defining property is that 4 is greater than or equal to t, and there'd be nothing wrong with that. If that's what you wrote, you'd just be so good, so perfect. However, it's a little more conventional when you're writing set builder notation to begin with the variable after the such that bar. So rather than writing the inequality 4 is greater than or equal to t, I'm going to write the inequality t is less than or equal to 4. 4 is greater than t means 4 is to the right of t. If 4 is to the right of t, t is to the left of 4. So 4 greater than or equal to t is equivalent to t is less than or equal to 4. And um, before I hand things over to Anne, I do want to talk about, once again, this difference between solutions and solution sets. Any single point number on this interval is a solution to the inequality. So negative 1 is a solution to the inequality. Negative 3.5 is a solution to the inequality. There is an unlimited number of solutions to the inequality. But the solution set contains all of the individual solutions. So the solution set includes all of the points on the interval. There is one solution set, and it contains an unlimited number of numbers. Each number in the solution set is a solution to the inequality. And now I'm going to turn it over to Anne so she can talk more about inequalities and give you more examples of set builder notation and introduce a new notation called interval notation. In this part of the lesson, we're going to talk about interval notation. And as we'll see, interval notation will be an alternative way to state the solution sets to linear inequalities. So the first thing we need to discuss is, what is an interval? We've seen many pictures of intervals, but we haven't really defined one yet. And then we're going to look at four different representations of intervals of real numbers. We'll look at a bunch of examples. So let's discuss what exactly an interval is. So we're going to look at a set of real numbers. We're going to consider the set of real numbers between 0 and 5, and including 0 and 5. 
So let's start with a real number line. And I want to graph the set of numbers. So 0 and 5 are included in my set. So I'm going to indicate that with closed circles at 0 and 5. Now I need to indicate that all the numbers between 0 and 5 are also included in this set. So I'm going to draw a line between the points at 0 and 5. This is a picture of an interval of real numbers. So you can see that an interval is kind of like what it is in English. Now there's a formal definition of interval. An interval of real numbers is the set of all real numbers that satisfy a given inequality. So behind that interval I just graphed was an inequality. So let's look at the four different representations of intervals of real numbers. They can be described four ways. Verbally, the set of all real numbers between 0 and 5, including 0 and 5. Graphically, we saw a picture of an interval of real numbers. Using set builder notation, which we've looked at in a previous part of this lesson. And finally, using something new called interval notation. So we're going to look at a couple of different sets of numbers and look at these four different representations. So here's a verbal description of a set. And this is the same set that we just considered. The set of real numbers between 0 and 5 and including 0 and 5. Here's the graph of that set. So now let's use set builder notation to describe this interval of real numbers. On my number line, I have an x. So all the numbers in the interval are values of x in the interval. So when I'm using my set builder notation, or building the set, I'm going to call my variable x. And this is going to be the set of all x such that x is between 0 and 5. And we also include 0 and 5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to literally put my x between 0 and 5. And if I choose a number somewhere in this interval, I can see that this number lies to the right of 0. So 0 is less than x, or x is greater than 0. And at the same time, any number in this interval lies to the left of 5. Now the endpoints of this interval are also included. So I need to use the less than or equal to symbol here. So this is set builder notation, which describes the interval graphed above. Now we have a new type of notation called interval notation. And it's more concise than the set builder notation. The way the interval notation works is I note the endpoints. The endpoints of my interval are 0 and 5 and I put them in increasing order from left to right. If my endpoints are included, I use square brackets. So the interval notation for the interval that we're discussing here is square brackets, 0, comma, 5, close square brackets. So this is an alternate way of describing this interval of real numbers. Now one of the things I want to point out here, when we have a closed circle, we have the less than or equal to symbol in our set builder notation. When we have a closed circle, we have square brackets. So there are parallels between how all of these notations work. So let me just say a couple things about describing intervals using set builder notation, because sometimes this can be a little bit tri tricky. So here's the set we were just considering. And here's the correct set builder notation. Now there are a couple of common mistakes that are made when describing the set using set builder notation. So I want to look at a couple of examples of incorrect set builder notation and talk about what's wrong. Now here's something that often happens. When I look at the description of the values of x here, this is what I see. I see that a number in this interval is greater than 0 and at the same time greater than 5. But if you look at the numbers in this interval, they're less than 5. 
So this doesn't make any sense. And one of the things you notice is that in this incorrect notation, the inequality symbols are pointing in opposite directions, whereas in the correct notation, the two inequality symbols have the same sense or direction. In this next example of an incorrect use of set builder notation, we see that the two inequalities have the same direction. But this doesn't make any sense either. This says the set of all x such that 0 is greater than x, that's fine, and x is greater than 5. Well, if 0 is greater than a number and that number is greater than 5, that would mean 0 is greater than 5, which makes no sense. So we have to pay close attention to what we write when we describe intervals using set builder notation. So let's work a few more examples. Here's a verbal description of another set of real numbers. This is a set of real numbers between 0 and 5, but ex excluding 0 this time and including 5. So let's see what the graph would look like. So in this graph, the only difference is that at 0, we have an open circle because 0 is not included in our set. So the set builder notation. It's very similar to what we had in the previous example, except now we're using strict inequality here because x does not equal 0. x is strictly greater than 0. So in interval notation, I'm going to list the endpoints. And 5 is included just like it was before, so I'm going to use square brackets. 0 is not included in this interval of real numbers. So I'm going to use a parenthesis. So parentheses correspond to open circles, and square brackets correspond to closed circles. Let's look at another set. Here's the verbal description of the set of numbers. The set of real numbers between 0 and 5, this time excluding both 0 and 5. So here's the graph. Neither 0 or 5 are filled in. Neither of those numbers are in the interval. So the set builder notation changes just a little bit. We have strict inequality for both of the inequalities in the set builder notation. For interval notation, what we're going to do is list the endpoints just like before, from smallest to largest, left to right, just like on the number line. Since neither of the endpoints are included, we're going to use parentheses to indicate that 0 is not in the set, nor is 5 in the set. Now, if you just saw this notation all by itself, it would be ambiguous what it represents. In this context, this notation represents an interval of real numbers. But we've seen the same notation represent a point in the coordinate plane this particular point in the coordinate plane would lie on the vertical axis. In the context of the math we're doing, it will usually be clear whether we're describing an interval or an ordered pair. But if you ever have any question about what the notation is signifying, make sure you ask. So let's look at another set. Here we're going to consider the set of non-negative real numbers. So all the real numbers that are not negative. So what would this look like? Well, here's the graph. Now, 0 is included in this set because 0 is not negative. And then we have an arrow indicating that all the numbers to the right of 0 are included in this interval. So in set builder notation, we would describe this interval like this. It's a set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 0. Well, what about the interval notation? We know how to start. 0 is included in the set. It's the smallest number in the set. It's the left-hand endpoint, so I start with a 0. But how do I indicate that this interval or this set of real numbers has no largest element in it? Well, the way I'm going to indicate that is by using an infinity symbol. And with the infinity symbol, I always use parentheses. 
So there's a couple of cautions here to think about. The symbol infinity is not a point on the number line. And the symbol infinity does not represent a real number. So when we write the set the way we just wrote it before, the set of all non-negative real numbers, we wrote it as closed bracket zero comma, inf comma infinity with a parenthesis. We cannot include infinity in this set of real numbers because it's not a real number. So we always use the parenthesis symbol with this set. So let's look at another caution that we have to think about here. The set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 0 is not the same as the set that has 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. in it. Here's a picture of the set of all non-negative real numbers. The set I've just drawn in purple is the set of all whole numbers. And you can see that there are a lot of non-negative numbers which are not whole numbers. For example, 2 and a half is a non-negative number, but it's not a whole number. So we need to be careful that we're using the right description of the set we're describing. Let's consider another set. Let's look at the set of positive real numbers. Now you might be thinking, we just looked at this set. But let's look at a picture. What's different? Well, what's different is that 0 is not included in this set. 0 is not a positive number. So the graph is almost identical to the previous example, except now we have an open circle at 0. Now let's describe the set using set builder notation. Well, here we're looking at the set of all x such that x is strictly greater than 0. So the only difference is, is 0 is not included in the set of positive real numbers. Now let's write the interval notation. The interval has a left-hand endpoint of 0, but 0 is now not included in the set. Just like with a set of non-negative real numbers, it has no largest number in it, so we use the infinity symbol with parentheses to indicate that. Now at this point I want to point out just how concise this interval notation is. When a mathematician sees this interval, they see the set of positive real numbers. It's a lot shorter to write the interval notation than it is to describe it verbally, although that's how we would talk about it. We could graph the interval, we could use set builder notation, or we could use interval notation. All of this describes a set of positive real numbers. So here we need another caution. There are two, I have two set builder notations here that are describing two different sets. The blue set is the set of all positive real numbers, which we were just looking at. The purple set is the set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to 1. Well, that's not the same. There are a lot of numbers between 0 and 1, which are in the blue set, which is the one we're interested in, which are not in the purple set. So we have to be very careful with the set builder notation to make sure that all the numbers we want to be in the set are described using our set notation. So now let's look at the set um, of all real numbers which are less than or equal to 5. Let's graph the set. So here, 5 is included in the set, and I'm looking at all the real numbers that lie to the left of 5. I can describe the set using set builder notation. Again, I have an x on my number line, so all the numbers in this interval will be described with an x. So this is a set of all x such that x is less than or equal to 5. So how do I describe this set using interval notation? Well, I know that 5 is the endpoint on the right. It is the largest number in the set in the interval, and it's included in the interval. So this set has no smallest number in it. Well, how will I in indicate that? Well, I'm going to use an infinity sign with a little minus sign in front of it. Minus infinity, negative infinity, 
it's not a real number. But this indicates that the interval has no smallest element in it. So now let's look at the set of all real numbers. Well, we know what the graph of that looks like. Now we had notation for the set of real numbers, which was a bold R. To write this in set builder notation, we're going to introduce a new symbol, but it's not a symbol we'll be using a lot. This is the set of all x such that x is an element of, that's what this little funny looking E means, the set of real numbers. Since the set builder notation for the set of all real numbers is a little bit much, I tend to use interval notation when I describe this set. This set has no smallest element, so I use the minus infinity sign. It has no largest element, so I use just plus infinity or infinity. This interval notation describes the set of all real numbers. So just to summarize, when we were looking at our examples, we were looking at a lot of different types of intervals. We looked at what we call open intervals. And in open intervals, we use parentheses at both sides of the interval notation. This corresponds to strict inequality. So an example that we saw was the interval of all the real numbers between 0 and 5, not including 0 and 5. The set of all real numbers is also an open interval. A closed interval includes the endpoints. That's what this notation is telling us. A closed interval that we looked at was the interval of all numbers between 0 and 5, including 0 and 5. There are also several different types of half-open intervals. This would be an interval, like the interval of numbers between 0 and 5, including 0, not including 5. Or we could go the other way and include 5 and not include 0. Also, if we have a set like all the numbers greater than or equal to 10, that would be a half-open interval. Or all the real numbers less than or equal to negative 5 would also be a half open interval. Just a reminder that the symbols negative infinity and infinity are only used with parentheses, never the square brackets. So we're going to finish up with some examples to practice this new notation. So what we're going to do in all of these examples is we're going to complete the table. And we're going to be given a description of an interval of real numbers using one of the three no notations, not the verbal description, but one of the other three notations. And then we're going to draw it or represent it using the other notations. So here we're given set builder notation. We're looking at the set of all t such that negative 2 is less than or equal to t and t is less than so what I'm going to do first is graph this interval. So the first thing I want to do is label my axis as a t-axis because that's the variable that's describing the numbers in this interval. And my numbers lie between negative 2 and 4. So I'm just going to put enough of a scale on this so that I can draw the interval. Now, negative 2 is included in the interval, so I'm going to use a closed circle at negative 2. 4 is not included in the interval, so I'm going to use an open circle at 4. And I'm going to draw a line in between my two circles to indicate all the points in that interval. Now, the interval notation I find really easy to write from the graph. Negative 2 is included in the interval, so I use square brackets. 4 is not included in the interval, so I use parentheses. I really see the correspondence between the graph and the interval notation. 
I read graphs from left to right, and I can read the interval notation from left to right as well. Now we're given the interval notation. We want to graph the interval and describe it using set builder notation. So I'm going to start with a graph. And I get to choose a name for the variable. So I think I'll call the variable z in this problem. So I need to graph all the numbers z that fall into my interval. Well, my numbers are between 25 and 100. So I'm going to draw a scale on my graph. 25 is the left end point, but it's not included in my interval. 100 is the right end point. It is included in the interval. And now I want to indicate all the numbers in between, which are also in the interval. Now I want to describe this using set builder notation. Since I decided to call the numbers in the set z, I'm going to use z in my set builder notation. And I'm going to plop z down between 25 and 100. z is strictly greater than 25 and is less than or equal to 100. This time I have a graph of the interval, and I'm going to just start by writing the interval notation. Negative 3 is the left endpoint. It's not included in the graph. 2 is the right endpoint. It is included in the graph, so I'll use square brackets. The set builder notation, t is my variable. t is squeezed between negative 3 and 2, but 2 is included, so I have to use the less than or equal to sign there. One final example here. We have the interval notation. We'd like to graph the set. So here, I just need a couple of numbers, like 0, 2, 4, probably good enough. 2 is the left endpoint, and it is included in my set. And I want to indicate all the numbers larger than 2 in this interval. So I'm going to draw a line indicating that all of the numbers greater than 2 are in included in the set, and then an arrow to indicate that this interval just has no largest element. Now I want to write the set builder notation to describe this set. So I'm going to choose a variable name. I'll call this variable lowercase t. So we're going to look at the set of all t. And what's true about any value of t in this set? It lies to the right of 2. So t is greater than or equal to 2. So that concludes our introduction to interval notation. As we start solving linear inequalities, we'll be using both set builder notation and interval notation to describe our solutions. If you have a preference, you can use that notation to describe your solutions. But you might want to practice with both set builder notation and interval notation while you're starting out. <laughs>